Hello. Hello. <laughs> State of mind. Uh, for, I've been forgetting to say, please subscribe, <laughs> hit the button right here. But that's all right. Please subscribe, hit the button. Um, how you guys doing? Good? All right. Today I have someone who's been a, a fitness trainer for 30 years or more. Three-time Mr. Natural America. And you, it, I love the, you know, I, I was a big bodybuilder fan my whole life. These people. That's one thing I, didn't, I don't talk about much. I have to, I'm an open book and I talk about a lot of stuff. But I was huge. Arnold Schwarzenegger, Robbie Robinson, Frank Zane. We can go down the line. Um, he was uh, Mr. Natural Universe. Can you imagine that? I think he, the oldest... No, Mr. Natural. The, the, the universe was before Olympia. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. That's why for me it was. I didn't really care about winning the Olympia. I wanted the universe because that's what I grew up seeing. Yeah. The uh, Olympia came later, so when I had a chance to do that show, I placed third. Uh, but I, I didn't really try for it. Oh, you were. Well, let me introduce him as okay, Lacey Weston. That's cool. <laughs> but I want to get into this right now. Okay. I want to say to him that we're going to talk about all your fitness stuff. Sure. Okay. And then you're going to tell me your life. You got it. Like you're writing a book. You got it. Because okay. his life is interesting. <laughs> right? It is. I don't want to hear is. that. Okay. Okay. All right. So I didn't know about the Olympia. You were Mr. Natural Olympia. Is that what it was? Yeah. So you have the, the uh, amateur league and the pro league. So I, I got third place in both the amateur and pro for Olympia. But it wasn't really the show I wanted to do. It's a funny story how that happened. Um, it was in, let's see, the, the Olympia was supposed to be in Arizona, I believe that was 2002. And uh, my photographer and I, we hit the airport in Burbank. And the cab driver was, got closed, claimed he couldn't find the airport, he was lost. So I missed the flight. And we're due to be out there at 2 o'clock so I can train and push out a little water for the show the next day. And it turns out we missed the flight and you had to wait for the next flight. So I missed the next, next flight, next flight, next flight. So we didn't get out of there until about 8 o'clock at night. They had to the shuttle us to LAX. So by the time I got to Arizona, uh, I got to Gold's Gym, tried a train to get some more water out of my system, so I'd have some detail the next day, but I didn't. Um, the next morning, it turns out that the president of the organization said that the New Zealand president didn't make it. He missed his flight. So they switched the order. So it was supposed to be the universe that day and the Olympia the following week. So they changed it and put the Olympia that day, which was great because I wasn't in the best shape because I missed the flights. And yeah, yeah. The, so I got third place. Damn. And uh, the uh, uh, universe was going to be in Hollywood the following week. So I took that entire week off work, trained my tail off, uh, made sure I got there <laughs> on time. Yeah. And I won every category there was that day. And I, I planned to do it. I just, it was a one-shot deal. So when I did that show, I wasn't going to do it again because I came out of retirement after 13 years. And so I trained uh, and, and did shows for three straight years. And so I was getting pretty tired, so I said, this is the last one. After I do this, no more. And when I did that show, I just got everything there was, and that was it, yeah. And you were just ripped to shreds? Ready to go, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What do you eat? At that point? Yeah. Um, well, prior to that, I was eating about 5,000 calories a day. But as you get close to the show... 5,000? <laughs> yeah, because when you're natural, you know, if you want to keep size, you're not using steroids, so you have to... You've got to keep calories up. You know, you have to manage the calories, manage your stress, manage your your sleep patterns, everything. Uh, but as the show gets closer, you know, you pull out unnecessary fats, you pull out uh, unnecessary carbohydrates. Uh, as the show gets closer and closer, you're pretty much on the skids. So doing, for example, say 10 to 12 sets of chin-ups, we start with about 30, uh, and you probably work your way down to not being able to do more than, say, 8 to 10. When you get about, in that last week of a show, you could probably do maybe 5 or 10 tops, because you're so weak. Yeah. People don't talk about that part. Yeah, because uh, you're weak at that point. You're weak you're... at that point because you're not eating as much. So the calories are cut. The fat's cut, which is your energy. The carbs are cut, which is your energy. So you're pretty much on protein and eating a lot of vegetables at, at that point. Um, and then the day before the show, you know, you're, you uh, restrict your water for almost 24 hours. What? So you have to actually train yourself like a camel. You have to train yourself to take in a lot of water prior to these shows. And then And not. then the day before, at least a good 12 to 15 hours before you taper off. Hoping that the next day, for example, let's say you're due on stage at 10 in the morning, hopefully they're on time, you're not on stage at two, because if it's two, you're gonna have a hard time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's man. tough. It's now, tough. Yeah. I'm very happy that 
you did natural. Sure. Yeah. Because <clears throat> all those are all on steroids. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And that's not healthy, right? No. Obviously. No. 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 It's different back then. It, it, it's like almost everything today. You know, you see a lot of people smoking. Uh, it's like smoking weed, yeah, and then the it, weeds it, worse exactly, now. Exactly. It's the same thing. So back then. Is that why these dudes are much bigger yes, now? Yes. Well, that, but also they're doing what's called stacking. So back in the day. Stacking. Yeah, they may have taken like maybe a couple pills, maybe a shot. Today they're taking pills and pills and pills and pills and pills and shots and shots and shots. So they're taking so much because they want to get back. For example, let's say that back in the day, you know, they may have done it throughout their career. The guys today are making their career two years and they want to get as big as they can now to get to the Olympia stage and they pretty much die or have kidney issues or what other kind of issues. And that's why they don't last like the other guys did. I mean, these guys are coming today. Their they're, they're, they're life expectancy is about the same as a house fly. They don't last. Are you serious? I'm serious, yeah. Now, yeah. why do you think, <clears throat> this is an interesting conversation to me, why do you think that the organization, Weeder right, or right, whoever, right. has never fixed that? It would end the sport. Because you have, so in the natural... But we're talking about lives, man. <laughs> All right. And it's called bodybuilding, not body dying. I always said that. Right? It's I love building. that. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Right. So, so but but uh, there, there's money to be made. For example... It's all about money, yeah, ain't it? Yeah. I mean, when I won the Miss Natural Universe, there was a guy, um, Lou Demi. He, he had a, a sports nutrition company called uh, Goliath's Nutrition. And I endorsed his products, but... Even for him, it got tough. So he got in the donut business. And believe it or not, he became the king of donuts in Australia, oh, right? Rip. But but uh, uh, I endorsed his products. And when it comes to getting endorsements as a natural competitor, uh, you're getting a Twinkie. I mean, you're not getting endorsements. You're, you're like, for example, for the Olympia, for the guys using steroids, when they win the Olympia, they win about four hundred thousand. And there's a couple of the shows where they get maybe two hundred or hundred. Yeah, they don't make a lot of money. No, and there's no, there's there's no, there's no, um, like in other sports, you have. Endorsements. Uh, you have endorsements, but also sponsorship. What do you, call it? you know, when you retire, you get. Oh yeah, the I, I know what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. So pension plan. Pension. So you yeah. don't have that. You don't have that. You don't have that. But see, all the money that they're making, they're using a lot of that for steroids. Their handlers, their trainer, agent, publicist, all of that, right? Um, taxes. You know, so when you're competing naturally, uh, when I won the universe, I got fifteen hundred dollars. But see, when I when I was competing, I never. Focused on the money. I get it. For me, it was the title. Because when I was a child, I always wanted to win those titles. That's what it meant to me. It's when I got older, I realized the business side. So I've actually made more than those guys on steroids with just my titles. Wow. Good example. Look at this conversation we're having. Yes. I'm alive. I'm healthy. Yes. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're on state of mind. Ex yeah, that's what I mean. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And you've written books. I love that. Yeah. yeah. And how's that working for you? Very good. You know, I, uh, I've written two, I wrote uh, Transform Your Reality, which is basically a book uh, where it helps people get out of their own way. You know, we've all gone through things in life, you know, a hardship, this and that and the other, but many people let those hardships block their journey, Yeah. you know, and, and, they, and they blame everybody. Uh -huh. So they spend a whole lifetime of blaming people, blocking their blessings. So that's what the book's about. It talks about meditation as well. The second book is She Was Worth It All, and that really is my life story. Um, the she is my grandmother. Oh, we're going to, okay, well, let's, let's, yeah. let's, okay. okay, before we get into that, <laughs> okay. okay, we're going to get into that. Okay. <laughs> His, uh, Lacey yeah. has a story, yeah. um, and I, and I got to tell you, I saw something he was talking, I didn't want to really, I didn't want to really uh, listen to it, because I just wanted to hear it for the first time here. Those are the shoes, I was going to get those shoes. You like these? They're on TikTok. I yeah, think. they're everywhere. Yeah, Costa uh, Yeah, how are them. they? They're comfortable. I love them. Yeah, I have, uh, a, I have a black pair and a blue pair. Look at, <laughs> look I thought at, you'd like these. Look at Lacey. I had a feeling you were gonna like these. Yeah, that's yeah. cool as hell, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't want to listen because I wanted to hear it for the first time. So I'm gonna ask you, okay, to tell me your story, mm -hmm. uh, like, let's say. You're writing a book All right. about yeah. your life. Sure. Yeah. And I want you to take me from the <clears throat> beginning to the middle mm -hmm. to now. Okay. That, that, that's a long story, so I'm going to try to condense it. You condense it. it. You got it. Okay, yeah. So ultimately, I was born in Milwaukee, you know, and, and my memory of that, we left when I was six months old, but my memory 
uh, when we went back was because there was a death. And so I remember um, probably prior to being four, because I can remember back as far as my last bit of three years old, somewhere in there. But we were in a, in a white chapel. I remember that. And we, we, uh, we walked in. See, there was nine kids. Uh, I'm last of nine. Right? Nine yeah, kids. Yeah. And it was my grandmother. Uh, although I didn't know who she was. Uh, if you remember that Fonicello, the orange juice lady, that's who she'd probably remind you of. Okay. So I never knew who she was. She was just always in the house. She's always around. She never looked at me. She never looked at me with favor. She never sat with me. So I just didn't know who she was. But, but we're in this chapel, and, uh, uh, and at that age, I didn't know what people were doing. They were crying, but I didn't understand. What, I just saw water coming down from their faces and making all these noises. And I saw people going to the front of the chapel to look at this, this box, yeah. this, this dark box. So I wanted to see what was in that box. I tried to run up there, and I was grabbed, and somebody put me back on, on, the, on the... How old were you? I was barely four. Wow. I was barely four. Uh, but I was always curious, George. That's why one of my nicknames is, is uh, Lacey Dick Tracy. Because I always have to detect and get to the bottom. Right, of right. So basically, uh, I did this about three times. And uh, the last time I tried, you know, I ble- believe the funeral was over. And we were leaving. And I remember when we were going back to the station wagon, uh, we all got in the car. And, and my grandmother, she just broke out crying. And I didn't understand why she was crying. The others tried to explain to me why she was crying. Uh, you know, that she was afraid of driving over a bridge. They were making up just different things. They didn't want to tell me it was a funeral. Somebody died. And the next thing I knew, I fell asleep. Um, when I woke up, we pulled into a driveway of a home. Now, I'm, I'm sure I woke up many times before. You know, little kids, you forget things. Your memory goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we were in La Puente, California. And we're at the house. And that's where the story begins. It's 1968. And, and uh, you know, I'll fast forward a bit here. So there were, there were four girls, five boys. And I was raised to believe that all the girls were my sisters and all the boys were my brothers. Wait, wait, back up. Say yeah. it again. I was, I was raised to believe that all the girls were my sisters and all the boys were my brothers. Okay. They're not. They're my uncles and aunts. So my oldest sister that I slept with, her name's Eva. Uh, she always took care of me. She changed my clothes, fed me, everything you can think of. But, you know, as a child, you don't understand what's going on. Right. Uh, and that's why I say my grandmother, when she would come in, she would never look at me, never really talk to me. Um, but Eva, you know, she she... You could, you could see she was going, at, even at that age, I could see she was going through a lot. She was very stressed. Uh, she didn't get along great with my grandmother. But the story is that my grandmother's boyfriend, uh, a, a man that she knew since she was 13, slept with her daughter. That's how I got here. Okay, good. You got it? No, but okay. say it again. So my gra- okay, so my, my Eva... Uh-huh. Who, who I thought was my sister is my real, is my mother. So I, one of the out of one out of the four girls is Eva. Okay, so oh, she's wow. my grandmother's daughter, and my grandmother's boyfriend slept with her when she was thirteen. So I was born when my mother was fourteen. Wow. Okay? So uh, long story short, my grandmother. Now the character you play on General Hospital. So my grandmother. If you could, if you could take Joan Crawford, Al Capone. And uh, let's see, let's pick another one. Uh, Scarface? <laughs> pretty much. That was the mindset she had. So to all my friends and to everybody around, they saw her as Joan Crawford. Nice and pristine and, okay? In the house, she was a holy terror, right? Um, Scarface, as you said, right? So that's what I grew up with. So and you didn't know that your sister was your mother? No. Because I, it, it was not, and the reason why that was, was because my grandmother, what she would have been embarrassed to say that her boyfriend slept with her daughter. So when, when my mother. Now wait, wait, now wait, when her boyfriend slept with her daughter, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. she allowed it? No, 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 no. It was just out it, of the. Exactly, side. exactly. And, and you know, back then, it's sort of like Jerry Lewis. I mean, Jerry Lee Lewis and these other guys. I get back it, I then, get it, okay. I get it, I get but it. But see, so that's why I was born in Milwaukee. So, so that happened. So my grandmother uh, set up my father. Right. And here's where it gets a little wild. Uh, he worked at, I believe, Caterpillar, you know, the, the, okay. the, the, the construction. Yeah. 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 And also Eastern Airlines. Remember Eastern Airlines? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he worked there. And, and the story I heard was that he, um, he went home one night with a woman and they were drinking, carousing, having fun, whatever. And when he woke up the next day, apparently he had $6,000 cash in his pocket. But when he woke up, it was gone. So he thought, 
She robbed him. So he grabbed his pistol. He always carried a pistol, for I understand. He grabbed the pistol, uh, went to her house, went to the back door, and saw her sitting at the table talking to a man. So he figured, oh, they both, you know, rolled me. I mean, this is a yeah, caper. Yeah, yeah. So he barges in, and she said, no, Joe, don't. And because she ran towards him, he said he got startled, and he shot the gun, and she died instantly. <gasps> yeah. And so the man uh, got up and went towards him, and he shot the man and paralyzed him. And when he realized what he did, he went to the police station, turned himself in. So he got 15, uh, 15 years, but he said he got uh, a, day, a day off for a day in. So he did seven and a half years. Yeah. But I did not meet this man until I was 27. These stories, oh my I heard because my grandmother would always brag about these stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So she would tell the story about this man who uh, she did this to. And I'd always hear the name, uh, two, two names, Perry and Joe. Perry was the nickname. But I would hear Joe. His name was Joe. And, uh, you know, and I would always hear this story. But let's move forward. So back in La Puente, so. But hold on one second. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you're with your sister. Right. Do you have an inkling that that's your mother at no, all? No, and I'll tell you exactly why. Do you look like? Well, uh, it, absolutely it, like her. I, she and I, she and I look <laughs> more like. But you would think it's your sister, so you wouldn't think that it's your mother. Well, look, I got a. Remember Kid and Play, the light guy? That yeah, was, yeah. My brother is as light as... So I've got a brother that was dark as this camera, as dark as Wesley Snipes. i got a brother that's as light as lighter than you. Wow. i got I got a sister with blonde hair, blue eyes. So when you have that, you're not thinking no, that... Okay. No. So ultimately, uh, you know, I just figured... Actually, the word mother didn't come to play. I called her Eva. So I didn't know what a mother was. I heard the others call my grandmother mom. I thought that was her name. So I was four years old before I called anybody mom. And that's because my grandmother beat it into me. Why? Because Eva, um, you know, my grandmother, another boyfriend she had, John, who's still living to this day, she, she, um, she was dating him, but she was a private duty nurse, so she worked through the nights. She had him stay with us to watch us. Well, you know, he got close to Eva. By this point, Eva's 18, right? Right. So they start sleeping together, right? Oh, my goodness. Now, I didn't realize this. So... Ultimately, he runs away with her. When he ran off with her... So he ran away with your mom? Yes. 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 And when he did that, that's when my grandmother absolutely had enough. I'm four years old, and that's when she laid the hammer down on me, and that's when the beatings began. From age four to about 16. Yeah, straight out, nonstop, nonstop. Yeah. Like beatings? Clockwork. Is, like with a... With a with Clockwork. Belts, extension cords, racetrack, shoes. Whatever she can grab, she would use it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lacey, yeah, how yeah. the hell? Yeah. When this, Everybody asked me the same question. Yeah. Did you come out so yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, good? I, I have to, you know, people have asked me that question many, many times, and the answer is always the same. I believe strongly in God, and he's been there with me the whole time. Wow. Eva did a wonderful job when I was a little boy of tell me about God, tell me about, you know, uh, uh what to believe in, and we go to St. Martha's Church in La Puente, and I'd be there, and I would have this feeling. And there's a part of the book where I tell the story that, you know, when I was four, the other kids that were going to school, and they would do carpooling because my grandma, like I said, she was working. And I'd have to stay home about 30 minutes by myself when they were picked up to go to school before my grandmother got home. And I was terrified. You know, they put on Mighty Mouse for me or whatever. I was just totally, absolutely terrified. Uh, and... And one day I was sitting in a chair, pretty, it was a rocking chair, pretty much like this. And I was watching the cartoons, but I was terrified. I wouldn't turn my head left or right. I was just terrified. And one day I felt this energy come around me. And, you know, kids always talk about, about a boogeyman, right? But that's not what I felt. It came around, and I felt it was getting close, and it came right up to my face. And I wouldn't look because I felt if I looked, it's going to come to life, and I'm gone. So I didn't want to look. And this would happen for, you know, several days. That had to do with you, your beatings and whatnot, maybe, of being... No, it was, no. It was a spiritual situation. I just didn't, at, at four years old, I didn't know what it was. Yeah. But I thought, I honestly thought something was coming to take me away, like, you know. So I thought this, I started thinking this is what happens to children when they're left alone, right? It's right. my turn. It's something's going to happen. But several times later, uh, I felt this energy, and it came in. And if you can imagine all the rain we've had lately and how cold it's been, imagine with a snap of your finger, it goes from a cold, rainy day to all of a sudden it's nice and warm and it feels comfortable. That's what that feeling did. Oh. It stopped being scary and it felt really warm and comfortable. And the feeling I got was, I'm with you and I'm going to be with you going forward. That was an angel. Exactly. 
Exactly. Yeah. And so at that point, I was no longer afraid. So when they left, I was no longer afraid to be home. And I remember the day my grandmother came in once. She started telling everyone, you know what? He's changed. He used to be scared and have a look in his face when I came in. Now, he doesn't look at me. He just, wow. yeah, 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 yeah. So it was a major change. So that's why throughout my life, I've had some pretty crazy situations, but I've always focused on the belief and the faith and the trust. Every Beautiful. single time. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, so you never had a conversation with, What's her name? Eva? I did. I was Ava, uh, what I, is it? Eva. Yeah. Eva. Eva. You never had a, uh, you know, you're my mother. Right. What's up? Well, see, when she ran away, I was four. Um, and, and, and it's interesting. I talk about the visions I receive and, and all. So I, I had a vision of this the night before she left. And we were sitting on the bed. I love watching old black and white movies. So we were watching uh, old black and white movie. And she was sitting to my left. As we were watching the movie, I started looking to my right because I saw a vision of her running with a suitcase in her hand with her belongings falling out of it. Um, and she, she noticed it and she said, Lacey, what are you doing? I said, oh, nothing. So I looked back at the television. But it started again. This time she was running faster and things were falling out and she went off at a very far distance. And she said again, what are you doing? I said, Eve, you're leaving me tonight. You're not coming back. Why are you leaving me? And she denied it, but I kept saying it. So she, she got upset. She started crying. She ran out of the room. That's when my other two sisters, actually my aunts, we know this today, right? But I call them sister aunts. So uh, Murtis and Connie came in the room, and they were always the cleanup crew. So they sat next to me, and they started rocking me, like, Lacey, it's okay. What's wrong? No, she's not leaving. You, you know, it's okay. Calm down. But I realized when they rocked me, they rocked me to put me to sleep, right? So right. I was fighting going to sleep because I knew if I fell asleep, Eva would be gone. Right. So I was fighting, fighting, finally I'd pass out. And when I woke up, uh, I'm in the bed by myself because I always slept with Eva. She was, she was not there. But the, window, the windows were open, right? And, and the curtains were just kind of slightly blowing a little bit of wind. And, and, I, and I grew up screaming because I had never liked open windows with the curtains like that at night. You were afraid to sleep in the dark. I always felt spirits were watching me. I didn't know what spirits were as a child, but I realize now why I felt that way. Even to today, if, if I was at my brother's house in Vegas, if, if I fall asleep, it could be light outside. If I fall asleep and the blinds are open, all of a sudden I wake up with a jolt as if someone's there. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So that night I did that. And my sisters ran and said, what's wrong? I said, Eva's gone. She's gone. I said, no, no, she's not gone. Go back to sleep. So I went back to sleep next morning. I was the first up. I'm running through the house looking for Eva and realize she's gone. Uh, everyone gets up. We're all looking for her. We go outside looking. I see her belongings, as I saw in the vision, her mascara, her cosmetics had fallen out of the suitcase, and they're alongside the house. So I started grabbing, picking them up, and I held them because those are her things. But now but she's part of me, so those are my things, right? So when my grandmother came home, you know, she walked in. She put her purse like she always did on the table. And she said, what's going on around here? And they said, Eva ran away. And at that point, I'm thinking, well, I thought you said you didn't know where she was. I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And my grandmother, when they said she ran away, her eyes zeroed on me, laser focused. And she looked at me as she said, you know, just the, the, the words I imagined at that time she would have said is, and she left him. Right. And that's the feeling I got from that point. Her eyes looked at me and I'm going to do this to you right now. This is what she did to me. She did yeah. this. And she walked away. And I knew at that point, at four years old, my life was going to be hell. I didn't know what the word hell was, but I knew whatever is bad, it's going to be that from this point forward, and it was. Yeah. Son of yeah, a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so at that point... So you never saw your Eva, mother, whatever it is, again? Until I was 13. I was 13. So, so uh, she... It's interesting. It's interesting when you go through school, a lot you learn. You know, you take biology when you're, what, about 16, 17? Right. But when I was 13, she reached out, not to me, uh, but to my grandmother. She had a kidney issue, and she needed a kidney transplant. So uh, my grandmother and my oldest brother, Danny, at the time said, you know, Eva's going to be coming. She wants to see you. So I got a little bit excited. You know, she wants to see me. But by this point, I'm 13. I already started bodybuilding. You know, I have a lot of friends. Right. You know, my, my, my mindset is I want to get out of this house, this crazy house. I'm focused on what my future is going to be. So at this point... I don't know this person. So when they said she was going to come, I, I really didn't care. And she showed up, and she showed up with something I used to love to have when I was a little boy, which are Barnum Bailey animal crackers. Yeah, right? yeah. So yeah. she showed up with this box to a 13-year-old kid who's a bit hardened now, right? And so she came to talk to me, and she put the bo box on my leg, and she said, do you want these? I said, not really. And she said, you don't like those anymore? I said, look, I'm 13 years old. And she said, you don't want to see me, do you? I said, no, I don't. So she left the room. But here comes Lacey Trace. I start eavesdropping, and I heard them talking. All I heard was, 
you know, Lacey's the only one that can do it. And I'm thinking, do what? Well, he's the only one. Finally, you know, I hear, well, if you need that kidney, you're going to have to go talk to Lacey. And kidney. Oh. And, well, yeah, they said I need a kidney transplant. I can't find one. It's had our time. So Lacey's the only one. When I heard that, you know, I was really good at this because of the beatings I would get. So I was always good if my grandmother came home, if she was in a mood, I was always good about dumbing myself down, making myself small, hiding, disappearing. <laughs> right. So when I heard this, I snuck out of the back door and I ran around the block to my friend's house, Sammy Serrano. So I, I rang the bell and I'm thinking, Sam, please get the door. Don't let it be your mother. So he got the door and he says, hey, man, what's going on? I said, we got to get out of here. He said, what's going on? So I told him the story what's going on. And he said, what do you mean they want your kidney? I said, we don't have any time to talk because they're going to treat, they, they know I'm coming here. So we have to get out of here. So Sam got his bike. I'm sitting in the handlebars. We ride down to the mall. And he got me some food because I was starving. So we rode around all day until uh, close to sun going down. And we rode down the end of my street. And my, uh, Eva's car was still there. So we just sat out until we saw her pull away. And I waited about a half hour because people in my house, whenever they drove away, I don't know what it is with forgetfulness, but they'd always forget something. Right. So I always come back 10 minutes later. So we waited about 30 minutes to make sure she was really gone. And when I got home, the most interesting thing happened. Uh, my grandmother said, Eva was really sad that you weren't here when she left. She wanted to say goodbye to you. And my grandmother said, you don't want to see her and you don't really care for her. Do you? I said, no. She said, I understand. It's the first time my grandmother ever in my entire life told me that she understood anything I felt. And so wow. when she said that, it didn't make any sense. And then my oldest brother said, you know, that was wrong of you to do that. She really came to see you. And I, I didn't say what I knew about the kid. Now, wh now, why didn't you want to see her? Because, because at that point, um, my intuition kicked in strongly. And so I could always sense when people were for me or against me. Now, I can play stupid sometimes because I want to care about someone so much right. that I'll be blindsided, and that's when I'll be taken advantage of. But in this case, my, my senses were pretty strong and on. So when she appeared, I realized it wasn't for me. She, she wasn't there out of love. She oh. wasn't there for me. She was there for herself. And at that point, you knew it was your mother? No. Oh, you... I, no, I still didn't know. They didn't tell me, no. But, but, but it was when I was in high school. Oh, my God. Um, when I was taking biology. But you had a, you had a sense of, 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 of this. You didn't want to be with your sister because that's what you thought well, it see, was. Well, see, here's what happened. So now this, I'll come back to this point, but I have to throw this piece in for you. So when I was four, when Eva ran away, um, my grandmother at that point had, 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 had to fit the story together because now Eva's cool. gone. Right. So who is this kid? You know, he's going to start, start school at one point. I can't say his mother ran away. I'm just, you know, some woman taking care of him. So uh, it was a, this was a scene where she was sitting in a chair much like this in her bedroom. Uh, the two brothers, Delmar and Jacques, who were her minions, really, right? They were the, the, the bane of my existence the whole time. We were always fighting. When I got into working out in bodybuilding, that's when it all stopped. But before that, there was always like a double team type yeah. thing. But they were sitting next to her, and whenever she would say something against me, they would actually mimic her. So one day she called me into the room, and I'm four years old, and uh, I walk in, and Jacques is actually sucking on her breast. He's six. Okay, he's two years older. He's six. This is her mindset, right? And so I could tell at that age that this is not good. So she called me over and told me to do it, and I said no. I kept saying no, so finally she said... At hey, four? At four. Because it, it just... Yeah, I just... You know, so, so she asked me to come close to her, so I did. And she said to me, call me mom. Now, out of all of that, call me mom. So at four years old, I'm still the same way today. When someone says something, it's important for me to understand exactly what they mean so I can really... Right, right, right. Back, right. So I'm thinking, call her mom. Why? What? Where's Eva? I mean, why am I calling? And she said, call me mom. And Murtis and Connie are outside and saying, Lacey, they're outside the door saying, Lacey, call her mom. I'm thinking, okay, now they're saying, call her mom. These two are saying, call her mom. And I'm trying to figure it out. So she grabbed me by my jaw. Squeezing, she said, I said, call me mom. And I'm trying to understand. And she put the fear of Satan in me, right? So she, she just, you know, yeah, call me mom. So I said, mom, you know, I said it. He said, that's what you call me from this point forward. So for the next nine years, I didn't, when I'd walk into the room, I would just start talking because I didn't want to call her that. And sometimes she'd catch on and say, why aren't you calling me mom? Okay, I'd call her mom. But most of the time, I would just start talking. You had a gut feeling it wasn't your mom? She wasn't my mom. I knew that.
I mean, there's no way. She would treat everyone else so... Well, she was kind of mean to everyone. Yeah. But I was the one getting the hardcore beatings. No one else was getting beatings, right? Right. It was just like... I, I can't remember a week where I didn't get it. Sometimes I got it a couple times a day. Yeah. So I just got used to it so much to the point that it didn't hurt anymore, right? Um, I don't know if that was possible, but it just didn't, I didn't feel the pain anymore, you know? So and, when did you finally... I want to get to that. Yeah, you, yeah. You, when you figured out it was your mom, that's what I wanted. High school, uh, Miss Tillotson, I was in biology. Yeah. And we're talking about donors and kidneys and this and that and the other. And, and when she said, yeah, it has to be a close family member to be able to do that. And I'm thinking, then why would I be the only one if there's all these other ones, right? Ah, right. yeah. And then I thought, you know, we do have the same eyes. We do have the same That's eyes. what you thought? Yeah. We have, at that point, when the teacher said that, it all started coming to me. And at the, that's why she came to me at 13 to get my kidney. That's why our eyes are the same. That's why our face is the same. That's why we're kind of built the same. That's, that's why everybody's different. Now I understand why Danny would always make jokes about Murdison and say, you have a white father. That's why. And, and then I start realizing. I get it. And then it started kind of coming in. I thought, okay. So, yeah, yeah. so that's why everybody looked different. Exactly. Lighter. Exactly. This, that. Exactly. Because they're, they, there's, there's, they, se there's seven different fathers. Out of nine kids. Seven yeah, different yeah. fathers. My grandmother was quite wild. She liked her fun. She yeah. Did. And she did She did some prostituting back in the day, too. So, of course. Yeah, so she did it all. She did it, capers, you name it. She so it all, then yeah. when you're figuring it out yeah. that this is, you know, this could be or this right. is or whatever, yeah. Yeah. what did you do? Uh, first thing I did is I got angry. Yes. Because I realized that um, my grandmother... Now I know why I'm getting all the beatings, okay, because my mother left me behind. But that's only part of the story. I didn't know. I didn't put two and two together with the boyfriends. My grandmother used to always say, you're going to be just like Eva. You know, she stole my two pairs of shoes, and you're going to be the same way. It wasn't shoes. It's, it's the boyfriends. I realized when she kept making this big deal about two pairs of shoes, that's why on the cover of the book I put two shoes there. It's the two boyfriends that Eva slept with. Oh. Right? right? And so that anger she had against Eva, I'm Eva's son. So she always, so whenever, whether it was bodybuilding or anything I did good at or was doing good, she'd always say, that, that's horrible, it's no good. You, you know. She'd compliment the others on something that they didn't even do, uh, but to me it was always bad, bad, it wasn't good. So wasn't she good. resented you because you were like crazy. Yeah. I mean, even around the house, uh, yard work, I'm the one out in the yard doing the yard work, whether it be before sunup, or sundown. The other boys, no, they can't because they got allergies, which they didn't. But it was always pressure, pressure. But but what happened when you asked me how I became or turned out this way? Like what, that, what happened after you you then when did you know no? Uh, the absolute truth came out when I was twenty seven. Oh, I I I, I uh, my brother Russ that I'm that I'm the closest with. You know, he lives in Vegas. He's about six years older. He, he called once and said, oh, yeah, I ran into our, our sister's godmother. Someone's name's Fanny. I can say this now. She said never say it, but she's gone now. Right, she right. said, if you tell the story, I'll be dead by morning. But she's gone. Other people are gone, so right, she's okay. Right. Um, he said, I ran into her at the grocery store, and she said, you're one of the Western boys. Oh, my God, I haven't seen you in years. I want to see you all. So uh, I went out. My sister Murtis went out, and Eva was supposed to go. We get to Vegas, and... Uh, I'm there, Murtis is there, and Eva was late. So we go to this woman's house, and she starts telling stories. And the stories she was telling were very accurate because they're the same stories my grandmother would tell. Right. You know, about the things they did, you know, uh, rent a house and, and buy tons of furniture and then have it delivered and then take off. Right. Right? These kind of things. And so uh, as she would tell these stories, she said, oh, by the way, and your father's alive. He lives in Peoria, Illinois. And I was married at the time, right? And my wife said, I thought you said your dad was dead. And I said, oh. I didn't know I'm finding out with you. And she's like riding my ass saying like, you know. Yeah. I thought, and I said, I didn't know. And so the woman, Spanny, finally said, please don't do that. He didn't know. He's learning right now. And I was really choked up. So, uh, uh, and she said, he's in Pure Illinois, but before you leave, I'll give you his information so you can get in touch with him. And I'm thinking, okay. Now at the time, when, when that happened, and, and she said, he's also going to tell you who your real mother is, right? Yeah. So everyone in the room is kind of quiet, right? And I'm just stunned. 
But when we left, I made sure I got the information. So when I got now, that, when she said that, mm-hmm. did you know it was a, a Eva? I started at that moment really feeling okay. I, I'm even this got to be it. So before we left Vegas, Eva shows up at my brother's house, and Murtis took Eva in the room, and said, "Look, he knows, right?" So Eva was furious. She called me in the room and says, "Let me tell you something. This lie has been going on forever. I'm sick of this. Oh. It's not true." She told her husband, "Get in the car," and they drove all the way back to Cerritos. Now, if it's not true, why would you do that? You wouldn't. She's still saying it's not true? She died about 12 years ago. To, the, to her death, she wouldn't tell me. But then when she died. But why? Because the embarrassment. Because she had two other kids. And they think I'm their, 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 their uncle. Right? And she couldn't bear to tell them the <sighs> truth that, hey, this is really your half-brother. Now, my, my, my half-brother, John, we've talked about this. He knows it. So we're good with that. But, but my half-sister, uh, Calandra, she's not good with it. She doesn't want to believe it. She's even even though Eva told them both before she. But died, now they have DNA the, the tests and they stuff. They don't care about that. Even, even though be, even though before Eva died, she went to the two of them and said, "Now, when I go, I want you to understand. You're gonna hear a lot of stories about Lacey being my son. It's not true. Oh, well, why would you wait all these years when they're in their forties to tell them a story like that? Why would you? Why would you wait that? That is wrong. Yeah, yeah it is wrong. So so ultimately, she just couldn't do it because of the embarrassment. Um, but. My, my father, when I met him, he was 72 when I was 27, and I always thought it was quite interesting. If you flip those numbers around, you get the same numbers, right? 27, 72. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, when I met him, I saw myself for the first time. I look exactly like him. You did? Exactly like him. And he was a landscaper. Did he tell you about your sister, mom? We were mom? in the airport. We were in the airport. My, my, my ex-wife's from Sweden. So we landed in Chicago before going to Sweden, so he met us there. And that's where I met him. He walked up behind me, picked me up off the ground. He was a strong guy, right? And uh, we sat and we spoke, and, and, and we started talking about a few things. He said, you know, you seem a little soft. He said, I spent some time in prison. You don't, I don't think you can make it in a place like that. I said, isn't that interesting? He said, what I said, you don't think I can make it in there, and you prove you can't make it out here. I, Ooh, I was that kind I like of guy. That. I was that kind of guy. I you like know, that. Just, I, you know. That's a good line. And so he said to my wife, he said, is he always like this? She said, well, let me leave you two alone. And I said, so, uh, you know, she was, she was 13. And he said, what? I said, she was 13. And he kind of dropped his head. He said, don't do that. I'm not going to bite you. I'm just, we're here. Two men, let's talk. She was 13. He said, I'm sorry, son. I'm sorry. I said, I'm not sorry to me. But just realize that I know, right? You know I know. And it's all coming out, right? Wow. Yeah, yeah. And at that point, he just didn't know what to say. He didn't know what to do. Yeah. So then, how was how was after you guys established that? Yeah. How was the energy and how was it ta- being with him? A- after that moment, uh, he brought he <laughs> he brought a couple of friends along, uh, which was really interesting. It was a guy who was probably about twenty three, four years old, and he brought a girl who was about twenty two. And I and he introduced me as friends of you know. Uh, once I did the trip to Sweden, we came back home. He and I spoke on the phone. We agreed to talk on the phone regularly. And say, said, hey, what do you think about that girl you saw that, that, uh, uh, that was with me at the airport? I said, oh, you know, she was all right. I think her name was Deborah. I don't remember. He said, that's my girlfriend. What? He says, that's my girlfriend. He was 72. She was 22 or 23, yeah. So again. He has it, a pattern. Exactly. It reinforced the whole thing, right? And so I said, okay, I, I, you know. There's a lot of guys, dad, that do that. I'm not really, uh, I, we, we don't talk about that. But we talk about other things. And then he would tell me, you know, he said, by the way, Lacey, just so you know, my, he said his mother was 100% Cherokee Indian, so he said, I want you to know her name was Lucinda Pettistone, so you are part Indian as well, so I want you to know her history. And he would always say he's going to write out a family tree for me. But we would talk on the phone, you know, maybe every the weekend, and he was the kind of guy who said, Lacey, I don't like spending a lot of money on the phone. So we'd be on the phone for like 90 seconds he want to get off. That's all we spoke, 90 seconds he want to get off. Wow. So he never made that family tree because he died of cancer. But, but uh, at least you resolved. Yeah, we had a 10-year, uh, 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 years of communicating. Yeah. And I flew him out here. He didn't have a lot of money, so I flew him out here a couple times. And he did not like staying at my house. He did not like my ex-wife when I was married. He didn't wow. tell me until I was divorced, but he didn't like her. He, he basically said... You're a good man, and you, you tend to do a lot for people, but you don't have people do for you, which is true, which okay. is very true. All right. And, and, um, and he said, I don't like seeing that, you know? And so he said, um, he said, I also don't like coming to your house. He says, because the way you eat. I said, what do you mean? He said, I fry everything. 
<laughs> he said that salmon and broccoli you made me with the rice and this yeah. and the other. He said, I can't take that. He said, I got to get out of here. So he couldn't, <laughs> he didn't want to be my house. Um, but, uh, but like I said, we got along uh, well. Um, I, I, I believe, I really believe that it was best that I did not grow up with him. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, but I believe it was great that I got to meet him for the time yes. I did when he was yes. older. Yes. Um, it, but like I said, I, I got a chance to really see, see the man that I came from. I get you. Uh, his, his mannerisms, right? Very much the same. I get that. He, he could be very calm. Yeah. Uh, very straightforward. Um, so I saw that so I could see that. And so since I realized Eva was my real mother, now I see the two people. He died in 2003, I believe it was. He was 83. Uh, yeah. And Eva died at 60, age 60. She and died. when she died, there, for you, there was no last uh, talk or? No. You know who Stephen J. Cannell is, right? Yeah, I trained Steve for many, many years. I met him when I was twenty-three. Yeah, that's he's from uh, Twenty One Jump Street. 18. Yeah, all that yeah. stuff. He Rock created all those. Yeah, we were very close, really, really good friends. And I looked at him pretty much like like a surrogate father. Right? Yeah, and he knew that, so we were very, very close. When he died, I couldn't stop crying. You couldn't mention his name for two years. I'll break. I, I still to this day train Rob Bowman as his, his godson. I'll see him tomorrow. We sat at a restaurant talking once I broke down. I'm at Eva's funeral and uh, nothing, 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 I, you know. And my sister said, don't you feel sad? I said, no, I'm just here because you guys asked me to be here, you know. I don't hate her, no. but I don't know her. I no. mean, I, I do, but I don't have that connection. No, of course not. I mean, once I have a... Plus, when you have that kind of secret. Yeah, yeah. What is that? Exactly. I mean, once I have a connection with somebody, it, it's a connection. I get you, yeah. Uh, the connection she had ended when I was four. And I carried that as long as I could. I really did. And that's why when you say the person I am, the way I speak, that's because of Eva, right? Right. The, the, the way I see things is because of Eva. She was really good about that. She was good about temperament. Don't be upset about that. Breathe it through. Take you can't, you, from, yeah. you can't even say mother. I mean, you're like, that is like so far right. from. Right, exactly, exactly. You know, Mother's Day and Father's Day, I used to get so annoyed. I know my training business, uh, how God has things happen, right? There was a point in my life, early in my early 20s, where I had like four therapists I was training in a row. Wow. Big mistake. Yeah. <laughs> Big yeah. mistake. Yeah. Because each one worked on me. Oh, so, you know, I saw you cleaning when you came to touch you how to do that, your mom? Oh, look at all those cups in the yeah, trash can. Yeah. You had a lot of clients. Who taught you how to do it? Yeah, you? yeah. And one day I just said, what is this thing with the money? And so the, the therapist said, you know, can we talk? So we did. And she pulled it out of me, and I kind of told her the story. And I told her that I really despised being asked about Father's Day and Mother's Day because I always lie. I would always say, you know, uh, yeah, we're going to yeah. do this. Yeah. And so why do you do that? I said, just to avoid the story. So why don't you just say I'm not going to do anything because I don't see my mother. Yeah. And I said, I can do that? You know, I was surprised that, you know, I guess I can do that. And from that day forward, I never did it again, right? But so far as mother, yeah, when it comes to my, my, my children, I get it for them. Right. Sure. When it comes to if I'm dating someone, I get it for them and I'll shower them for that Mother's Day if they have children. Uh, but for me, no. no. See, uh, and I'm going to we'll conclude it now. But sure, sure. That was an incredible story. I think for, with you is it's kind of like my wife. OK. Who lived a real tough life yeah. with families, drugs. And sure. All kinds of just tough stuff, yeah. abuse, right. whatnot. Right, right. And now, and because of that, she became this great person and so giving person. Yes. I think that's you. But she has to be careful. Because, Tell me why. Tell me why. Because she is so giving. In the world, you have yes, take, yes. You're you're giving, absolutely right. You have takers and givers. Yes. And some takers sometimes don't even realize how much of a taker they are absolutely but they always spot the givers and they gravitate towards the givers and we can't do enough to give right and so that would explain a lot about the relationships i've had you know so i take a person at their word right from the time i meet them that's your word but 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 as for your wife yeah she can be an incredible giver but you may sometimes have to step in and say honey take it easy because yeah. because she she'll doesn't be stop. taken. yeah she doesn't stop and i go through the same even my daughters, my son, yeah. they, they will say, hey, dad, you know what? 
watch out for that person because you, you're giving a bit much, right? Yeah. Even when it comes to dating, hey, dad, you know what? You're, you're really given here. And so it's, 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 it's not by being naive or, or stupid. It's because it's just in you to do that. And when you've been through so much, uh, 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 so many hard times and like so much have, junk, yeah. Yeah, you don't want other people to go through that. So people always ask, Lacey, why are you so happy? Why are you smiling all the time? If you can go back and live the life I lived then and then be able to live as I live today, you'd be smiling too. You'd be smiling too, yeah. All right, Lacey. Jeez, this has been like a hearing a movie. <laughs> Hey. <laughs> and it was wild. Yeah. It yeah. was wild. <laughs> it was like, papu, papu, right? papu, exactly, papu. exactly. And you know, it's funny. It, it, and that's like maybe 1% of the whole thing. But I'm glad we got to that piece. That's I'm glad yeah, to share it with you. Yeah. It's beautiful, man. Yeah, yeah. And I think you've, you, I say to people, because I've been through a, a lot. I can tell. You, you can tell. I can tell. Yeah. And when you go through that type of hardship, when you get through it, it, it will make you better. Does. But you got to take the right road. Got to take the right road. You got to yeah. figure it out because yeah. if you don't take the right road, it could get worse. It can. It can. And and it's so important because you, you not only do you take the right road, but you have to be careful to stay away from people. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's why I made it a strong practice. And I've been had my 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 son, my daughters raising them. I always made it clear, you know, uh, I've always avoided these kind of things and these kind of people in my life. And so I've always encouraged them, you know, if you if you come across people like that, that's your life. Do what you want, but. I can't be a part of that because what people don't understand is that when you've been through hard times like that, you understand it better than most people. Yes. And if you befriend people like that, it's like an addiction. You want to help them too. Exactly. At your own detriment. I get so it. So I have to stay away. I get it. I have to stay away. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. Um, what can I say? Check it out because this is <laughs> it's a wild ride. And... Uh, I appreciate you coming. I appreciate you. I appreciate you talking about your whole life. Sure. sure. A lot of people don't don't do that. Yeah. And uh, I'm happy you did. Thank you. State of mind. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. Okay. That was good, man. Awesome, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah.